Good evening from Ho Chi Minh City. My name is John Kyo and welcome to another 10 by 10 series. In this series, I'll speak with 10 experts for 10 minutes on different aspects of digital transformation of the agri-food sector across emerging economies. And I'm delighted to have with me today, Dan Weinberger. Good morning to you, Dan. Uh, good uh, good uh, evening to you, John. Uh, thank you so much. This is uh, Dan Weinberger uh, coming from Burlington, Ontario here in Canada. Uh, so for for me, it's 7.30 a.m. and it's evening for John. So thank you so much for accommodating for me. Wonderful. And for those listening, Toronto is normally my home. So just down the street from Burlington. Uh, Dan, right. the 10 minutes goes very, very quickly. So uh, in the first minute, can you tell us a little bit about you and also about your company? Yes, most definitely. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I am the uh, my name is Dan Weinberg. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Morpheus Network. Uh, Morpheus Network being a supply chain automation platform. My background is actually in supply chain specifically. Uh, what we do at Morpheus, uh, we act as this middleware layer, uh, sort of a, a binding glue to the fragmented systems in supply chain. Uh, we're talking about different stakeholders as well as different IT systems as well. Uh, so excited to talk to you today, John. Wonderful. Dan, we're going to talk about digital transformation. We're going to talk about uh, emerging economies and the food sector. What are you seeing happening and what kind of experience have you gained over the last couple of years in approaching uh, emerging economies with digital transformation technologies and tools? You know, listen, uh, there's so many companies involved when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, food, the food sector, as you mentioned, uh, all the way from the raw producers, all the way down the line to final consumers as well. Uh, so for us at, at Morpheus, acting as this middleware layer, being able to connect all these different systems together, what we look for is sort of like a centralized hub that can connect us to all these different stakeholders down the supply chain. Uh, we found that, uh, you know, quite beneficial when it comes to a top down approach. Uh, both with governments or with big companies uh, who are dealing with their stakeholders who you know potentially are, let's say, a small farm uh, in a rural area in Canada uh, who wouldn't even consider digitalizing their entire efforts. Uh, but if we have a company uh, who they're selling to, basically, who needs them to digitalize their cert certificates, uh, then we help them with that digital effort. Uh, we, we step right in there, basically. And, and you know, we, we've done this with FCL in Canada specifically. Uh, we're doing it with uh, phytosanitary certificates in South America, uh, an agro traceability system in Africa as well. Uh, and, you know, we can get into, you know, what, what it takes in these emerging, uh, you know, nations, uh, you know, with emerging technologies in order to get them to use these technologies. Uh, it's not as simple as, you know, just hand them technology and get them to use it. You, you have to make it easy to use, obviously, right? You have to make it be able to be used within their nation itself. So uh, lo lots of things to consider, uh, but it's a very exciting time. Uh, and I find that with Morpheus, that top-down approach has been very successful for us. Wonderful. Dan, let's mine into what you just talked about. You, you talked about South America or Africa. You, you pick which one of those. What, what are the key challenges uh, that you face and that organizations face and even governments face with digital transformation? Yeah, you know, listen, it, it makes sense to, to focus on, let's say, Africa, South America, for example. Uh, we have uh, some great partners in both regions of the world, of course. Uh, I also think of, you know, for example, uh, we work with some companies uh, who do some exportation of garments, of fabrics, right? Uh, work with a company specifically right now uh, that it turns out that certain provinces in China uh, that in the United States, they're not able to sell the garments if they come from a certain province in China. Uh, now, China itself, I wouldn't consider, a, you know, let's say a third world nation necessarily, uh, but the rural areas of China, uh, be able to connect those rural areas to a complete digital footprint, the entire supply chain, so that you have that trust within the products that you're receiving in the United States, they're not being manufactured in improper ways. Uh, th these are the systems that we're finding uh, something simple. Uh, you know, COVID actually showed us, you know, my, my parents in their 70s uh, went, went to restaurants, you know, right when COVID sort of was picking up and let people come to restaurants, but there are no paper menus. I never thought I'd see my father pick up his cell phone, scan a QR code, and then scan through his phone to order a meal. It's as simple as that for these Chinese farms, these Chinese, uh, you know, cotton, uh, cotton manufacturers, cotton farms, uh, basically be able to scan where they're actually producing their cotton, then send it to the cotton gin, send it to the, you know, the fabric makers themselves, the dyeing facilities, all these different facilities need to know exactly where they're being, you know, using their workers from so that they can export into the United States. Once again, a massive company, multi-billion dollar company using a top-down approach to allow rural farmers in China to be part of this digital effort. Yeah. So so that uh, handheld device, so that mobile technology is obviously going to be very, very critical to, to, to scale up. But what are the challenges in actually engaging with uh, communities of farmers and getting them on board? Is that a big challenge? Do you know what? Once again, uh, uh, I hate to say it, but when there's a, a monetary reason for companies 
uh, to push ahead with what they're doing. They're going to lose, you know, a ton of revenue without pushing ahead with these digital efforts, getting their, you know, low level, say farmers to be a part of that effort, then they will push ahead with it. And, you know, to be honest, uh, it's been quite simple. We've had, uh, you know, uh, industrial manufacturers in China, uh, in plants, in far corners of plants, scanning QRs to know updates on machines, adding engineering certificates, let you know uh, certificates when it comes to exportation as well. Uh, all the the ocean BLs, uh, you know the the uh, packing lists, everything has to be added in order to make that export happen properly. We have manufacturing facilities in China adding these document, adding all these documents as needed. Uh, we have the same thing obviously happening in North America. Uh, you know, and, and it's funny how in North America and in Europe, uh, even though a lot of these systems are quite prehistoric. Uh, we focus on the emerging countries, the, the countries that are, you know, third world nations saying how they, they have to sort of, you know, become this digital powerhouse when in fact, the first world nations really have a lot of improvement to do as well. Uh, we're only really, you know, as you know yourself, under 5% of the way there to full digitalization across, uh, you know, first world nations as well. Uh, so it's exciting over the next five, 10 years, uh, as you're saying, involving these countries and third world nations, uh, you know, companies in third world nations as well, but also those main hubs uh, who are pushing the economy. Uh, and really pushing ahead the, the efforts globally. Wonderful. You know, I spoke to a few people who discussed uh, Africa and digital transformation across Africa. And of course, there's many, many uh, countries in Africa and many, many different types of uh, of, of problems to solve. Um, but, you know, several of them actually talked about the brain drain out of Africa. So their best and their brightest are actually leaving. And some of the technologies there are actually very old. So you have a brain drain of, of people leaving the country. And then you have people that stay there are using older technologies. What kind of a challenge does that pose for large firms bringing in technology providers like you? Are you guys going in directly? Definitely, a, definitely a large challenge. Uh, what our sort of like strategy has been with, you know, let's say, for example, working in Uganda uh, and, you know, myself, I've never been, you know, physically in Uganda. Uh, our team itself has not been to Uganda itself, but we have a partner in Uganda. Lois Technologies is, is on the ground right now implementing, right? So that brain drain in, in Africa is real, most definitely. But at the same time, it opens up a huge opportunity in Africa as well. It's completely untapped market in a sense. Uh, you know, as as companies are growing, they're realizing rare, rare earth minerals, mines, you know, there's so much in Africa right now that people haven't tapped into. Uh, so even though there is people leaving for the, let's say, quick buck, I guess you can say, uh, to move to America or move to a place mm -hmm. where they can make a lot more money over the next, let's say, couple of years. In the long run, Africa is an untapped market and we're going to see so much growth over there in the next 10 years for sure. Wonderful. Now, my favorite topic in my research focus area is on transparency and trust in global supply chains or supply ecosystems, or I, I prefer to call them. So what does your solution do to enable transparency and increase trust? Great question, great question. Now, uh, obviously when it comes to uh, supply chain, when you have two different parties, you know, uh, many parties involved in supply chain, but we're talking a buyer and a seller, uh, there's reasons for buyers and sellers to not necessarily trust each other, right? When there's money involved, right? Uh, so we, we like to have an independent, third party involved when it comes to all the data to make sure that all parties can view that data and trust it at the exact same time. That, that's where we have that inherent trust. Uh, so what, what we, we've built with Morpheus Network, actually, uh, we built this decentralized node network uh, where all the data that's filed through our platform also in parallel goes through this node network, gets notarized through the node network, and then verified on our platform that it's identical. So even if our platform has a bug, has a hack, if someone gets in there somehow and changes some data, we still have that decentralized network that has the original data set itself being verified the exact same time, leveraging the blockchain, leveraging that inherent power of immutable data on a blockchain. When it's written, it's never changed, can't be changed, and you can verify it within our digital footprint, also in the decentralized node network as well. Wonderful. That's that's a great, great response. And how would you deal with uh, governments? Let's say you were up in front of, uh, you know, 25 different uh, governments, you're talking to ministers responsible for innovation. What would your pitch be to move towards a digital transformation policy? Listen, John, I, I, I can pitch to them, you know, all the different statistics and, you know, all the improvements that can happen. And I could talk about the future and I could talk about sustainability. I could talk about, you know, the people and how it would help the people. And these aren't things they haven't heard before. So yeah. I feel that, you know, you're kind of putting me on the spot with this, but what I would do, I want, I want them to understand it so they can actually see it with their own eyes. You know, I, I like to say put it in their hands, but with a, a software, it's more to see how it works, show them exactly how they can leverage these emerging technologies to change what they're currently doing. Don't make it this amazing story. 
put it right in front of them, show them how it's done, how companies are doing it right now. And if they put that effort towards, you know, their entire country, they can make a huge change. And it's not something that, you know, some, you know, crazy, you know, fantasy story, if they can see specifically how it works in front of them. So I would love to show them right in front of them exactly how these emerging technologies, whether it's IoT, blockchain, and how they all work together, you know, how we, we tie in all these different stakeholders in order to push ahead and optimize supply chains. This is what I'd like to do. Very important. And I asked that question because here in Vietnam, we're also, you know, pushing back on the government, making sure that they're creating that enabling and policy environment where technologies can be deployed. And of course, in, in this area and digital transformation, especially in agri-food, you know, having a policy that enables fintech would be very important because the mobile technologies, mobile payments all become uh, critically important. So, Dan, we're nearly over time, but I want to give you another 30 seconds to uh, what advice would you give to industry players, big companies, small companies, and they're considering a digital transformation stra strategy? 30 seconds. I, I would I would tell them to, you know, for, first of all, obviously seriously consider it, right? Most companies are seriously considering it. Uh, but I would say that it's it's hard to increase your revenues by saying just sell more products, sell more cars, sell whatever it is. But if you look at your supply chain, look at where the biggest holes in your business are, that's what should be tying in all that data together. No more data silos, dynamic data, pushing ahead automation to push ahead more revenue, push these companies to the next level. 30 seconds. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, so there you go. There you have it all the way from Burlington and Ontario. Dan Weinberger, CEO of Morpheus Network. Dan, thank you so much for joining me this so early in the morning in Ontario. No worries at all, John. Great to talk to you again. Uh, and everybody you. who's watching, of course, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dan.